This is episode two for AP Psych for Tuesday, uh, continuing our discussion of intelligence. And I need to go back and make sure we talk about the culturally fair test. This is a pretty important point in intelligence testing, as we'll talk about a little bit later. But a culturally fair test is created for people from other cultures, uh, and the tests often use pictures and designs and things along those lines, trying all they can to avoid any specific cultural biases. Uh, they usually downplay the need for vocabulary, and they also downplay the need for speed when it comes to answering questions. Uh, these are things that people who may not understand the culture or may speak English as a second language perhaps won't do as well at, and that whether that has any kind of reflection on their intelligence or not uh, is uh, another issue, but the truth is that uh, very intelligent people who don't know the language are going to seem very intelligent in some testing. So culturally fair testing is something that is a, a big part of today's look at intelligence, and we'll be discussing more about that uh, later on, and we'll even talk a little bit about The Bell Curve, the book that came out in 1994. All right, back to our terminology. We talked a little bit about reliability and split half reliability, giving both or having two versions of the test, and that's one of the ways you can figure out whether someone uh, is uh, whether a test is reliable. So, and then we talked a little bit about how to deal with individual variants. Now, the reliability coefficient is the statistical measurement of reliability um, of a test. It's a stats measurement that uh, shows that most intelligence tests are around a 0 0.90 when it comes to reliability, and that's uh, pretty good stuff as far as being a reliable test. As a side note, uh, there is a small amount of statistics that you'll find on the AP exam, and uh, we're not going to really go over it in class very much, so you'll want to hit the part of Phil's chapter, or the chapter in Phil's book that actually talks a little bit about it. If you've taken a stats course, you've gone way beyond anything that will be on the AP exam, but if you just need to refresh a little bit, you need to take a look at the chapter in Phil's book, or the little portion of Phil's book, that talks about that. All right, some more factors about test. Uh, content validity, in other words, is the content within the test itself valid or does the test test what it's supposed to? Um, does it measure what it claims to measure? If it claims to be an IQ test, does it measure things that are considered to be components of intelligence? The IQ test has an adequate number of questions about the supposed subject of the test, but because there's no agreed upon definition of intelligence, there's no perfect content validity in intelligence testing. So um, the idea is that since they can't come up with an answer to what it is, you'll never get a 100% uh, content valid test, but most of the uh, intelligence tests that we have discussed and will discuss are considered to be valid. Our next term is criterion-related validity. Do people taking other such tests score the same as on this one as they do on the other test? So how do they correlate? Uh, most acceptable intelligence tests seem to have criterion-related ability. So these are some terms that you may find as we discuss intelligence testing, and you might find it on the AP exam. Now, some criticisms of uh, intelligence testing. The complaint that intelligence tests measure things that have no relevance to the real world, that's something you might say about a lot of the tests that, that we take. Uh, intelligence tests measure ability to take tests, but not intelligence. They may discriminate against minorities. The speech that is used or the verbs that are used or the verbal, um, the meanings of the words may not be the same for somebody who's not familiar with the culture itself. And even within the culture of the United States, there are variances in how people deal with things that could affect the scoring that you have on an intelligence test. Uh, one of the fears is that it may discriminate against minority groups because the stories and the, the situations that are brought up on some of the IQ tests are ones that they're not as familiar with, which would add to the difficulty of the test for themselves. Um, so there are some cultural differences. Now, uh, a fourth problem is labeling or tracking of low scores that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, the idea being that if somebody is labeled as a low score or having a low IQ, then people won't expect as much from them, they won't expect as much from themselves, 
And the term for that, which we, which we also call self-fulfilling prophecy, is the Pygmalion effect. So if you see that term that's well, on the AP exam, that's what you'll be thinking of, is the idea that if people don't think that they're good at something, they're not going to try. We discussed this already in uh, Phil's video. And finally, the fifth complaint, intelligence tests do not measure motivation, motives, or attitudes. Those are things that you really can't find from just taking a test. So, do IQ tests relate to success? Well, if you look at this list, there's uh, some interesting perspectives there. And some of the people who uh, you see there uh, uh, have regular vocations that don't seem to... Um, lend themselves to high IQs, like Bobby Chiz, the boxer you see there with the IQ of 140, Dolph Lundgren, and who plays a, an action hero star in the movies. Uh, he has a very high IQ, but you can see that uh, different people have different IQs, but the truth is, overall, high IQs seem to translate into high success rates in school, business, and perhaps even life. So our next question is, what causes intelligence to occur? What determines it? Uh, a side note here, adoption studies and twin studies are obviously very important. And we start with the influence of heredity. And the researcher here who's the most important is a man by the name of Robert Tryon, who work, does his work at Cal Berkeley. And he has demonstrated that a specific ability uh, to do something, in this case running a maze, could be passed down genetically between rats. So he bred... Well, what he termed as maize dull rats together and he bred what he termed as maize bright rats together and what happened was with each successive generation the maize dull rats got worse at running mazes and the maize bright rats got better so is there any relationship here uh, to humans well let's take a look at the next slide uh, you can see here that identical twins raised together have similar intelligence identical twins reared apart slightly less and so forth so you can see that uh, intelligence seems to be connected to your genetics um, a couple of other uh, factors to keep in mind adopted children have IQs that are significantly similar to their birth mothers but remember that there is uh, nine months of similar environment between the birth mother and the child prenatally and we're going to be talking about how important that is as we move forward uh, adopted kids um, uh, are sometimes placed in a similar situation as they would have been in for, as far as socioeconomic structure structure um, when they're placed in their adoptive home similar to what they would have been before but the, we'll talk about how SES affects things as we move along all right, so what about environment? Uh, severe undernutrition during infancy can substan substantially lower IQ scores. Diet and IQ are strongly correlated among young children. Now, in an extension of Tryon's experiments, maize dull and maize bright rats were raised in both enriched environments and non-enriched environments. Now, uh, what you see on the far right here, that's the non-enriched environment, just the rat in the cage. What you see here in the middle is the enriched environment where they have plenty of things to do and to play with. In the enriched environment, both dull and bright rats respond by becoming bright or better at running mazes. Uh, so in this case, the maze dull rats were raised to the bright level as a result of being in a uh, enriched environment. In the non-enriched uh, environment, both responded by not showing brightness the maze bright were dumbed down to the dull level. So in this case, what we see is it seems that environment is really the most important thing. A French study seems to verify this effect in humans. The socioeconomic status of parents has an effect on the IQ of the adopted child's IQ scores, regardless of the socioeconomic status of the birth parents. Children adopted by high SES parents had higher IQ scores than those adopted by low SES parents. Why? High SES parents offer better nutrition, a more enriched environment, more exposure to different types of language, and parental involvement. And as a side note, I suspect that since you're in an AP psychology class at a school as elite as Ursuline, that your parents provided you with that enriched environment. So it's the environment that seems to be the key here. So what we've heard so far is that Tryon says it's genetics 
and other research seems to say it's environment. So let's have the showdown, and we're going to get the answer from a researcher by the name of Eric Turkheimer, who put forward his answer in 1991. He used plants as the analogy for the answer. So he took uh, seeds from particular plants, taking two groups of seeds from the same plant, raised one group in enriched soil and one in non-enriched soil. The, in the enriched soil, the plants grow taller due to the soil, that's environment, but seeds within the enriched so soil will grow to different heights depending upon their genetics. So let's take a look at the uh, images that we have here on the screen. On the left, you see the seeds from the plant that are put in enriched soil. Now you'll notice that the there are different levels. The ones that are a little shorter are actually from the um, seeds that weren't as um, as good as the, the seeds genetically as the seeds that created the taller plants. So in both cases, the genetically superior and those that aren't, in the enriched soil they grow taller than either type does in the non-enriched soil but the difference that does occur is based on their genetics. And what happens in the non-enriched soil, uh, neither of the types of uh, seeds grow to the level that we'll find over here in the enriched soil, but the less genetically inclined seeds will be the shorter plants you see here, while, while the taller ones are better genetically. So what does it mean? Everything's a combination of nature and nurture, which we've seen in a lot of other parts of psychology. So let's talk about a couple of other issues. We'll start with the Flynn effect. That's the idea that IQ scores have continued to rise steadily since the 1930s. Now, uh, in some cases as high as six points per decade. Why? Nobody's sure. Could be environment, could be genetics. Um, one of the interesting things is if it was genetics, it probably could not change that quickly, but it could have some effect. Let's take a look at some possible answers. Perhaps we're just smarter than we were decades before. Perhaps we're better at taking tests. That could be it, too. Perhaps better environment and nutrition. You've got to figure that's part of it. Perhaps the complexity of the modern world has caused the brain to develop. And one other, th one other thing to throw in there when it comes to the Flynn effect is they didn't really measure it prior to 1930, so perhaps it had been going up before that, and we just don't know that. Now, uh, a couple of other things to keep in mind. Let's take a look at a study that was very important in the history of the United States and actually related to IQ. It's called the Milwaukee Project in 1961. And the question that this project was trying to answer was, could intervening in a child's family life offset low SES effects on IQ? IQs of enriched children from low SES families were increased 51 points on average when this program that was piloted in Milwaukee came into the home, uh, fed the children, helped them uh, to uh, be more stimulated and grow up in a much more nurturing environment, sometimes at home, sometimes at uh, daycare centers. But the children started out with a 51-point higher average when they went into grade school than the children who were not part of that pro project. Um, and of course, as it says here, and you've already figured out, this leads to the Head Start program that was begun in 1965 and is still around today. Uh, many of you probably have some familiarity with it, and we'll talk a little bit about it in class. Um, now, some complaints. The IQ effects didn't seem to be permanent. Um, a lot of the students' IQs dropped once they got into the school system. Uh, but the program gives long-term benefits in many other areas like graduation and other things. So there's no question that it works and it's one of those programs that actually has support from both sides of the aisle in Congress and you don't see that very often especially with a program that in essence um, takes tax money and gives it to people who generally aren't as well off in great numbers. But this is one that really seems to work and it was based on intelligence testing. Okay, a little bit about gender and IQ. Um, Girls are more verbal, while boys tend to be stronger in math and spatial ability. And we'll talk a little bit about those differences when we come back in Episode 3.